Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Sarah Thin will defend the academic thesis entitled Beyond Bilateralism, a Theory of State Responsibility for Breaches of Non-Bilateral Obligations. Dear candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you, Prorector. Uh, dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear friends, dear family, dear colleagues, for the next 15 minutes, I will be giving a brief summary of the essence of my doctoral research. And I'm going to begin by explaining the essential problem this thesis sets out to solve, namely the lack in international law of a theory of state responsibility for breaches of non-bilateral obligations. Now, to explain what on earth I mean by this, we're going to start by looking at the traditional model of obligation and responsibility under international law, namely the bilateral model and uh, where it fails. So in the bilateral model, we have two states. Here is an example. We have the Netherlands and the UK, both states that I would call home. Um, under the bilateral model, one state owes the other state an obligation. Now, this could be any number of obligations. It could be trade-related. It could be diplomatic immunity. It could be an obligation to allow the UK certain fishing rights within Dutch waters. There are many possible examples. Um, the obligation, uh, sorry, the UK then holds a corresponding right to performance of that obligation. Now, this is the bilateral model of obligation. If, uh, if the Netherlands were to breach that obligation, this would trans, uh, translate into a bilateral model of responsibility. The Netherlands, uh, in violating the obligation owed towards the UK, would cause the UK injury. As an injured state, the UK would then have a right to invoke the responsibility of the Netherlands. That usually just means bringing proceedings before an international court or a tribunal. Um, and uh, it would have a right to reparation. So the UK would have a right to reparation from the Netherlands, and the Netherlands would have a corresponding obligation to make reparation towards the UK. Um, there are two essential characteristics to sit, uh, in this model. The first is duality, so there needs to be two states. The second is exclusivity. So uh, in the bilateral model, responsibility exists as a relationship between two states and only as between these two states. So no other uh, interests or rights come into play. And that's best illustrated by asking what happens if the UK were to waive its right, so to give up its right to invoke the Netherlands' responsibility or to claim reparation. Under the bilateral model, if it does this, and that's essentially the end of the story, uh, the Netherlands' responsibility would remain uninvoked and would, for all intents and purposes, cease to exist as a result of that waiver. Now, this model works for some obligations, but what about the kinds of obligations in international law that just don't fit this model? Let's consider... Um, the Biodiversity Convention. So the Netherlands has certain obligations under the Biodiversity Convention to take steps to protect internationally significant biodiversity within its own borders. What happens if it violates this obligation, for example, by building some factories uh, in uh, nearby particular examples of biodiversity? It has broken the law, it has violated an obligation, but there is no injured state. So following the bilateral model, there is no state to invoke the responsibility of the Netherlands. There is no state to claim reparation. So this is one example of a kind of obligation that doesn't fit that model. What about situations where there can be an injured state, but the obligation in question is, is considered uh, so important, so central to the interests of the international community as a whole, that it should not or cannot be left up to the exclusivity of the bilateral model? Let me explain. So let's take the prohibition of aggression. The Netherlands owes an obligation to the UK not to commit aggression towards the UK. So what happens if the Netherlands invades the UK? The Netherlands violates an obligation in relation to the UK, thus making the UK an injured state. The UK therefore has a right to invoke the Netherlands' responsibility and claim reparation. So far, so good under the bilateral model. However, the prohibition of aggression uh, generates other rights as well. So this is recognized, this, this obligation not to commit aggression is recognized in international law as being part of the fundamental international community interest. As such, it is an obligation ergo omnis, which means that all states have a right to invoke the responsibility of the Netherlands for breaching this fundamentally important obligation. So it doesn't fit within the exclusivity of the bilateral model. This again can be illustrated by asking what happens if the UK were to waive its right to invoke the Netherlands' responsibility. Under the bilateral model, um, as we saw before, this would essentially lead to the extinction of any possibility of the Netherlands being held responsible 
Um, however, that doesn't conform with what we know about how these community obligations work, how these community interest-oriented obligations work, and it would essentially render all of these other rights ineffective. So what we see here is two different ways in which certain kinds of obligations don't fit within the bilateral model. This is essentially the problem that my thesis seeks to solve by, uh, by, by forming a model or by forming a theory for the responsibility for breaches of non-bilateral obligations. It does so in four main levels. So firstly, it's a matter of theory. What exactly is this form of responsibility for non-bilateral obligations? How do we conceptualize it? Next, how does that theory fit within the, the regime of the law of state responsibility? Next, from law to practice, how does that fit within the operation uh, of uh, international courts and tribunals and their practice and procedures? And then finally, taking a step back, how does that fit, uh, or what is the impact on, of this new form of responsibility on the international legal order as a whole? So first, how do we conceptualize non-bilateral responsibility? We've just seen that bilateral responsibility is relational. It exists as a relationship between two states. It is subjective in that it exists only as a relationship between those two states. And it is based on injury. So it is based on the injury caused to a state through the violation of an obligation. Non-bilateral responsibility, by contrast, is a status or a condition, not a relationship. It is objective, so it exists objectively within the legal order and not only as between particular states. And it is based on legality, not on uh, the injury caused to a particular state, but on the breaking of a rule per se. Now, this is what I call the objective theory of state responsibility, uh, of uh, non-bilateral responsibility, or the objective approach to non-bilateral responsibility. And it is this, uh, this theory that I apply throughout the rest of my thesis. Uh, moving to the law of state responsibility, um, I apply this theory to the, the different stages of the law of state responsibility to ascertain whether it fits, so whether, uh, whether it works as a theory with the modern law of state responsibility. The three stages are the origin of responsibility, so that's the, the initial breach um, and uh, circumstances including wrongfulness, which are essentially defenses in international law. The content of responsibility, so that's the legal consequences of the breach, usually remedies. And implementation uh, of responsibility, which means yeah, invocation and enforcement. What I find is that in each of these three stages, the law of state responsibility has evolved to a point where the objective theory that I set out fits very well. Um, and not only does it fit, but it can also, uh, having this theoretical basis and applying it to the law of state responsibility, can also serve to resolve some of the existing inconsistencies and areas of confusion within the law of state responsibility. Next, we move from law to practice and international courts and tribunals. Uh, now, the practice and procedure of international courts and tribunals has evolved mostly alongside the traditional bilateral model. So here we ask three questions. Firstly, despite this, in accordance with their practice and procedure, can international courts and tribunals incorporate an objective understanding of non-bilateral responsibility? Do they actually do so? And then finally, what is the impact of that on their role, so on the international judicial function, if they were to incorporate this objective theory of non-bilateral responsibility? I find, in brief, that yes, there is plenty of room within the existing practice and procedures uh, of international courts and tribunals for them to follow this objective understanding of non-bilateral responsibility. Whether or not they actually do so is slightly more of a mixed picture. It depends a bit on the body, um, but some of the more traditional bodies in particular are quite cautious in applying this uh, more non-bilateral focus or more objective focus on non-bilateral responsibility. And part of this caution, uh, I submit in the chapter, is due to a lack of a lack of certainty over what that means for their international judicial, judicial function. When you look at the, the bilateralist paradigm, this uh, way of looking at international law very much positions international courts and tribunals as uh, dispute settlers between states. So pure and simple, they just settle disputes in between states. Whereas when you apply a more objective understanding of non-bilateral responsibility, this positions them more as guardians of legality um, protectors of the rule of law, per se. It's much more focused on legality. Uh, and I submit as well during this chapter that having a clearer theoretical understanding of that can hopefully resolve some of that uncertainty and perhaps even lead to a less cautious approach by 
international courts and tribunals. So finally, we turn to the international legal system. Um, international law has traditionally been conceived of as a private legal order, so predominantly concerned with the relationships between states. However, when we look at a lot of the developments that go along with non-bilateral obligations and non-bilateral responsibility, many of these look and feel more like a public legal order. So what I do in this chapter is to look at various aspects of legal theory and domestic legal theory, draw out the essential characteristics of publicness and what it means to be a public legal order, and apply that to the, uh, to the, the international law, the international legal system. And what I find is not only does international law clearly uh, show increasingly many of these elements of publicness, but also that, uh, that a non-bilateral responsibility and particularly an objective conception of such is an essential part of that transition from a more private to a more public legal order. Some final remarks before I finish. International law has changed and is changing. So part of the reason that this uh, that we are seeing more and more of these non-bilateral kinds of obligations um, and that this is becoming more, of a, more and more of a pressing issue is that international law is no longer uh, exclusively, no longer maybe even primarily aimed at uh, protecting individual interests of states and the relationships between states um, or between individual states. Increasingly, international law, the purpose of international law is understood in part in the promotion and furtherance of common and community interests such as human rights, such as the protection of the international environment. Um, and these are the kinds of interests which, when protected through law, tend to lead to the non-bilateral forms of obligation that we discuss in the thesis. So this is an important backdrop to, uh, to the research. Next, legality is central. It is central to understanding the new focus of international law. It is central to understanding the changing role of international courts and tribunals. It is central to understanding the nature uh, Sorry, it is central to understanding the changing nature of the international legal system, and it is also central to understanding this new form of non-bilateral responsibility. This thesis has demonstrated the, uh, the necessity, the importance of having a new model for non-bilateral responsibility. It is essential for clarity, it is essential for stability, for consistency, and for workability. Uh, now, this new model is formed not by imagining uh, what could be or what should be in international law, but by drawing together the elements that we already have, by articulating a structure um, so as to figure out what is needed, what is needed to fit them all together in a coherent manner. This missing piece, I submit in the thesis, is the non-bilateral theory or the non-bilateral approach, uh, sorry, the objective approach to non-bilateral responsibility. Um, and this theory not only fills that gap, but it also unifies all of these different elements and presents them as different parts of a system that are aimed towards ensuring compliance uh, with international law and protecting and promoting the international rule of law. With that, I thank you for your attention and I hand the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Leinzaat, who is Professor of the Practice of International Law at our university and who is also the Chair of the Assessment Committee. Thank you. Madam Candidate, dear Sarah, today is the day, so feel relaxed, enjoy the afternoon, but not before we have had the opportunity to raise a number of serious questions. Uh, I was very happy to read your book. It's an interesting theme, and the book is very readable. In tune with the times, I would say, uh, you're asking very pertinent questions about the state of the international legal system and uh, whether the law of state responsibility has moved in the right direction with respect to non-bilateral obligations. Well done for an interesting book. The timing of your book could not have been better if we look at the current caseload of the International Court of Justice. A number of cases address issues that could qualify as dealing with non-bilateral obligations, such as the case of Gambia versus Myanmar or the Ukraine versus the Russian Federation case. The case of Gambia versus Myanmar deals with the Genocide Convention and the state of Gambia 
can really not be seen to be a victim of Myanmar's domestic actions. Yet it attaches great importance to the prohibition of genocide. In the case of Ukraine versus the Russian Federation, the Genocide Convention is also at stake, where, uh, and that was my count yesterday, so far 17 states have intervened on the side of the Ukraine. This is also an example of states acting in respect of what may be called non-bilateral obligations, taking up what you are calling non-bilateral uh, bilateral responsibility issues. My questions in this respect are the following. These intervening states formally act on the grounds of their rights under the Genocide Convention read together with the provisions of the ICJ Statute on Intervention, such as Article 62 and 63 of the Statute. That seems to suffice for their participation in litigation with respect to a situation in which they are not really victims themselves. That's the case, for instance, for Australia and New Zealand. But they seek to ensure respect for a fundamental international legal instrument. What then is the added value of your thinking on this subject matter when we already see states acting on the basis of non-bilateral responsibility in international litigation? Is it the case that the rules on intervention somehow are insufficient in your view to protect interests, the interests of the international public order? Or is Inter intervention as a judicial mechanism itself not that fundamentally different from your thinking and is it a tool bridging the black and white divide between in bilateral and non-bilateral responsibility that you sketch in your book. Perhaps you could also include your proposition one in your response, please. Thank you very much for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, and also for, for your compliments. I think indeed in many of the cases that are currently on the international, uh, on the docket of the International Court of Justice, um, demonstrate the relevance of the theories that I develop in the thesis. Uh, I think the, the Ukraine-Russia case is particularly interesting, partly because of the rather creative um, jurisdictional argument that they used to bring the case. Um, so uh, the, the case has been brought on the basis of the Genocide Convention and the interventions are brought on the basis of Article 63 of the ICJ statute. Um, so what is, technically speaking, Article 63 is, is, provides a right for states that are also bound by the same convention to intervene on the basis that, that, that the uh, interpretation of that convention could have an impact on them. Um, so, at least from a kind of technical legal perspective, using Article 63 is not necessarily intervening on the basis of a common interest. Uh, it, it could be seen as uh, intervening yeah, to, to have a say in the interpretation of a convention that could have an impact on that, own, uh, that state's own individual interest. However, what I think is really interesting in all of the interventions that we're seeing from the many states intervening in the Ukraine, I think there's nearly 15 or 16 now, the many states intervening in the Ukraine-Russia case, is that in their declarations of intervention, they base their intervention on Article 63, but they emphasize the common interests of the Genocide Convention explicitly, and many of them explicitly say that they have a special or a particular interest in the application of this convention to that case. Um, so that almost seems to blur the lines between yeah, interpretation and application, which is Article 63 and Article 62 um, intervention. Um, I think uh, to, to kind of go to the question of what the added value of my thesis on these uh, questions related to, um, to intervention, I think what we see from uh, my analysis of practice and procedure of international courts and tribunals is that the, the tools are there, right? So I think that I wouldn't say that we have insufficient procedures. I think that uh, Article 62 and Article 63 of the ICJ statute within the ICJ um, remit uh, 
are or could at least be sufficient, depending a bit on how they're interpreted by the International Court of Justice, because there are still some questions, especially over what kind of a legal interest is required under Article 62. Um, so yeah, I think it's a useful tool, um, but that it that is surrounded a bit by this uncertainty and by this kind of um, lack of a clear through lack of a clear theoretical basis as to why exactly or what legal basis exactly states are intervening on. And I think that is demonstrated again by the blurring of the lines between Article 62 and Article 63 there. Because I think states are, it feels like they are trying to intervene on the basis of this common interest, but relying on the interpret, um, the, the fact that the, the convention is also applied to them. So this interpretative basis under Article 63. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that I would hope that my work adds some further clarity to that and further clarity to the basis upon which states could intervene on a common interest rather than necessarily just this slightly artificial uh, interpretative basis. I hope that answers your question. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Brus. Professor Brus is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Groningen and he's also a member of the assessment committee. And I would like to welcome him very much to Maastricht University today. Very good to have you. Thank you, Rector. Esteemed PhD candidate, it was indeed a pleasure to read your work. I found it a very insightful piece of work, and I happily join in the praise which was already given to the work. It reminded me also about the enthusiasm of ourselves, probably when we started our PhD, to see how we can come up with theories that, that really say something meaningful about the changes that are going on in the world and what the role of international law is in that. And I think you succeeded very well in providing those insights. Yet, we are here to oppose you also a little bit. And therefore, I have a question which to a large extent follows up on what, uh, what, what uh, just was asked and, and to your responses. My question is that in your conclusion, in the one but last paragraph, you observe that international law is quite different to what it was several decades ago, and that this evolution can be linked to the acceptance of the objective theory of non-bilateral responsibility in international law. I'm afraid that I differ with you in this observation. Did international law really change? I see that the questions that you raised were also raised in the 1980s and the 1990s. Also in relationship to like Omnis norms, your Skogans norms, and they did already exist. There are some gradual developments, in particular when it comes to the acceptance of certain Jaskogans norms and Eric Omnis rights and obligations also in the jurisprudence of, for example, the ICJ. Uh, but I'm afraid that it's still too early to speak of a fundamental change in international law in such a generalized manner. This is a very broad and general question. Did international law indeed change fundamentally in the past 20, maybe 25 years, the past decades? That is how I interpret this. Uh, but make, making my point less abstract, I would like to look at one specific example. Has international law developed significantly in accepting publicness, publicness to be able to state that now any state can take countermeasures against Russia for violating international law in its war against Ukraine? In other words, are sanctions that violate legal obligations of these states vis-a-vis -vis Russia acceptable under Article 54 of the Articles on State Responsibility. And are they lawful measures, as it is mentioned in that article, to ensure the cessation of Russia's breaches and to ensure reparation uh, to Ukraine? In section 4.2, you briefly discussed Article 54, but the conclusion is, in my opinion, a bit evasive. You state that your theory cannot provide an answer to such a practical question. But the ILC could not answer the question in the 1990s. But would it now be possible, with the help of your theory, to answer this question uh, in line with your claim that international law has changed in the past decades? Could we now, 
reformulate Article 54, saying this is firm international law that is based on the theory of objective responsibility. I look forward to your answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, just to clarify, there are essentially two questions here. One is about whether or not uh, um, essentially community interest countermeasures would be allowed against Russia, but also more generally now in international law. Uh, and the second, whether we can really speak of fundamental change in international law, or the other way around. But um, I'll take the countermeasures one first, if you don't mind. Um, so I think it, it is... I don't know if I would entirely find it fair to talk about the conclusion in my thesis as evasive. I think it is... Uh, um, the point that I'm trying to make in the thesis with regard to these kinds of community interest countermeasures is that the, the fact that we have um, non-bilateral obligations in international law and the fact that we have um, this objective form of responsibility for such obligations, that doesn't necessitate uh, community interest countermeasures. I think the two are quite separate. So whether or not the um, the breach of one of these kinds of obligations, um, either uh, more specifically the community interest obligations, the rules of use covens or obligations or omnis, or um, the um, the other form, the structurally non bilateral obligations that I call them in the thesis. Um, I think that there needs to be something more just than understanding that responsibility is objective to say that there is a right to take countermeasures um, in relation to that. Um, I, I think it is impossible for me to answer the question without doing a proper study of the countermeasures that have been taken and the reactions of states to them as to whether or not that has evolved as, some, as a, a right under custom, because I think it would need to be, if we were to say that international law had evolved to the point that states were allowed to take community interest countermeasures against Russia in this particular case, that would need to be a question of custom. So it would need to be a question of whether there's sufficient state practice and sufficient opinion yours, um, which was outside the scope of my thesis and which I haven't done that survey, so I can't answer that question now. Um, I, I would like to think that from a general perspective, having this clearer theoretical basis on what exactly it means to have responsibility for one of these uh, kinds of obligations or for a breach of one of these kinds of obligations perhaps clears some of the underbrush for that question to be answered, but I don't think it, it can answer that question in and of itself. Um, and then more generally on the, the changing nature of international law. Um, so I do think that it's right to say that international law was never completely exclusively bilateralist. Uh, there were always kind of uh, it was primarily bilater bilateralist, and we do see sort of historical examples of obligations that can be seen as non-bilateral, particularly in international humanitarian law, um, but it has been an evolution. So I would say it is an evolution of international law rather than a kind of overnight change or a fundamental change. Uh, and we are talking about a process of decades, so I think the... I'm not saying that this has happened within the last 20 years. I think the, the main changes kind of start around the 1970s when you see like this big um, increase in multi, uh, like multilateral treaties, um, particularly in environmental and human rights fields, um, which uh, demonstrate this increasing focus of international law on uh, more common interest-based uh, regulation. If, if I may interrupt you here for a moment, Mr. Rector. Um, then, then, but, but if I look at what happened in the 1990s, you mentioned it, then there were all kind of treaties concluded, which really represented part of what you, you are indeed stating. But if you look at the last two decades, I see a, a backward trend that states are very reluctant to accept anything which bind them, which would seem like a, a general obligation for the common good. Or am I mistaken there? Uh, I think it is true to say that there is, that, you know, that there has been less uh, or fewer, fewer of these attempts to make these broad-ranging sort of legislative and quotation marks treaties. Um, but I think in the last few decades we have seen, uh, in we have seen still developments in that direction. So I think it's only really been, um, I forget the dates exactly, but I think somewhere around 2013, 2015, the first um, properly non-bilateral. Uh, cases before the ICJ, um, in the sense that you have um, like the whaling in Antarctica case and the um, Belgium-Senegal case, 
Um, so we are seeing developments in international law which are pushing that further and further, uh, but it is, it's, it's not the same as, uh, as it was in the 70s and 80s. So I do think that this is a trend that's ongoing. I don't think there's a backward step. Um, but yes, it's, it's not, it's an evolution rather than a re revolution, if I can say that. Thank you. I would enjoy continuing the conversation, but my time's up, I'm afraid. There will be other opportunities, I'm sure. Um, the opposition will now be continued by Professor Tsiberi, um, who is Professor of International Law and Human Rights at the University of Oslo, and also a member of the Assessment Committee. And I also would like to welcome him very much to Maastricht University today. Wonderful to have you here with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, dear PhD candidate, dear Sarah. It's a pleasure to see you after a little bit over three years when we met in Oslo. And I join my colleagues in congratulating you on having completed an important research project that addresses a topic bound to get increasingly more attention by international scholars in the years to come. In your PhD manuscript, you have answered, and um, I was very happy with your presentation here, uh, where you simplified uh, what is, I think, a f quite a complex theory. Uh, you have answered four sub-questions, developing a theory of non-bilateral responsibility, testing it against the law of international responsibility and the practice of international courts and tribunals, and exploring the implications for the international legal system. Um, I missed an overarching question, which probably would go along the lines of what is the role of and implications of non-bilateral responsibility uh, for the international legal system. And to be sure, there are many implications, including perhaps some non-intended consequences. I have a lot of questions, but will limit myself as we will have other opportunities to engage on these issues. Uh, my question is, how can one apply the non-bilateral responsibility to some of the current global challenges, which in my view embody community interests, namely ensuring human security, countering climate change, and protecting world cultural heritage? And I would like to provide an answer in the current context of a fractured international cooperation and solidarity and decline of multilateralism. To make the answer more concrete, uh, it would be great if you can frame it through the lens of some of the ongoing uh, situations and then highlight the benefits, a little bit along the lines of Professor Leinzad, the, the benefits of applying this theory and maybe any shortcomings to these situations. Concerning human security, we can look at the ongoing situation in Syria, which uh, is an armed conflict ongoing for more than a decade now. Uh, concerning climate change, we can look at some uh, landmark international adjudication, but also the forthcoming COP27 meeting. And concerning the protection of cultural heritage, we can go back again to the example of Syria with the destruction of the site of Palmyra or the destruction of religious and historic buildings in Timbuktu, Mali, where one is the focus of the ICC and the other one is the focus of nothing actually at the moment. But so that uh, brings me to a conclusion of my first question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, just to clarify, so the question is, what are the, what are the, the benefits of uh, the theory that I developed in the thesis um, for, uh, for dealing with the three uh, current challenges that you see? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a very broad question, I know, <laughs> but uh, it would, if, if you give your thoughts on this uh, and, and um, briefly on these three particular situations, thanks. So I think because my, my thesis in the theory is focused on responsibility, um, there, um, it's focused on the point after there has been a breach, if that makes sense. So, so it's not necessarily um, that, I don't think that anything I do would change necessarily the nature or the substance of obligations that states hold, but rather how it works when they are, um, how international law deals with a breach of uh, these kinds of obligations. Um, so perhaps if I take, um, yeah, they are three very big questions. Um, perhaps if I take you climate can, change. You can choose whichever you want of the three. 
Um, I will take climate change first then. So I think there are, uh, the thing with climate change and with dealing with climate change through international law, it, it's, it's, it's obviously such a big problem and the international legal obligations we have to work with are relatively um, limited in different ways. So a lot of the cases that have been brought more recently have been on the basis of human rights. Um, there was a recent decision in, uh, regarding the Torres Strait to the Human Rights Committee. Uh, and so we are seeing kind of, um, we are seeing international legal bodies applying um, human rights norms, but tend to be also non-bilateral obligations to these problems, um, to climate change. Uh, lots of complex difficulties remain there with regard to shared responsibility, um, the, the, yeah, the, the, um, shared responsibility and also the you know, cause and effect, so the, the, the um, actions that states take and the extent to which, uh, or the link between that and the harm that's caused to, in relation to climate change. Um, I think that uh, with regard to the benefits of my theory, I think that the part, the part of my thesis that most operationalizes this concept of um, non-bilateral responsibility is in, in uh, clarifying the law of state responsibility, but also looking at the, the features of the practice and procedure of international courts and tribunals and trying to set those out um, and explain their uh, parameters in more detail. So I think um, with regard to the admissibility and jurisdiction questions and the extent to which courts uh, like the ICJ, um, are able to take these kinds of cases. And once they take those kinds of cases, how different interests can be um, incorporated into the proceedings through third party intervention, but also through Amici Curie. I think that uh, contributes at least a part to the big question that is uh, something like climate change and the non-bilateral obligations that are um, relevant there. I do think that as a kind of the question more generally of how non-bilateral obligations work within the human rights field and the application of human rights to these kinds of problems deserves further research because there are particular elements to human rights law and the, the rise of the individual in international law, the humanization of international law um, that is related to uh, objective responsibility. But I think um, it was not something I focused on in the thesis partly because um, because lines need to be drawn somewhere, partly, um, but also because the conclusions that could be drawn from looking at that side of international law and human rights would uh, not necessarily be relevant for the, the, the whole theory, but only the human rights parts. And the attempt was to, write, to develop a theory that would apply generally and not only to specific areas. I hope that answers your question, <laughs> or some of it anyway. Are you satisfied with the answer? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. In that case, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Smith, who is Assistant Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Hasselt and also a member of the Assessment Committee. And I also would like to welcome him very much to uh, Maastricht University. Thank you, Rector. It's, it's wonderful to be here, especially in person uh, in Maastricht. Dear doctoral candidate, dear Sally, if I may, it's been a pleasure to be a member of your doctoral committee and now a member of your PhD jury. I recall very well uh, a meeting we once had, a stimulating conversation that took longer than uh, your supervisors <laughs> were willing to endure in the faculty boardroom of Hasselt University. And I kind of wish we would have had more of those conversations because already then it was clear to me that I was engaging with an intelligent and committed young scholar. And now here we are a few years later at your defense. Uh, the book that you're defending today, I find it uh, on the descriptive level excellent. Uh, it's written in a clear and accessible style, and I personally find chapter five on the publicness of international law uh, strong. Uh, I was overall impressed by the range of subdisciplines, themes, and especially concepts of international law that you discuss throughout the book. Uh, I should also acknowledge that it's no mean feat to set as a goal for yourself to construct a theory, uh, a new theory uh, is your ambition, that cuts across international law. Uh, and I believe you must be commended for taking on this challenging task and for providing us with a few building blocks that are necessary to construct such a theory on state responsibility for breaches of non-bilateral obligations. Uh, 
But as my uh, former opponents, I'm not only here to praise the good aspects of the book, I'm also here to challenge you by asking you uh, at least one question. And, and when I ask my question, I want to make it clear that uh, I'm coming at this as, I believe, a relative outsider, uh, a scholar of comparative constitutional law and human rights law, not one of general international law. And so my question follows along the, the lines of questions you've already had, uh, and it's mostly intended for you to help me understand, as a relative outsider to your specific field, the precise scope, and perhaps even more importantly, the limits of your analysis and your main argument. Uh, I find that especially important because you claim a few times in the book that you're constructing a theory that has broad relevance for international law as a whole, and you just referenced it again uh, just now. Uh, and, and knowing that, I kind of found it striking that whole branches uh, and institutions of international law that I would ordinarily associate with multilateralism uh, and a more public understanding of international law are not very much discussed in the book. Uh, so branches such as international human rights law, which you just referred to now, uh, or climate change law, which was referenced before, but also institutions like the UN Security Council or the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and so I have, I have a question to you um, on the scope of the analysis. It's made up of two parts. Uh, my first, first part of the question is, um, could you explain to us your choice not to include, so your negative methodologi methodological choices, <clears throat> So not to include other branches and other institutions of international law in your doctoral research. Or to put the question differently, and you can also answer, answer that one, it's, it's exactly the same question. Why was a study of ARSOA and three tribunals, including ITLOS, which I would rate as a rather specialized tribunal, more relevant to answer your main question than, for instance, the study of international human rights law or the role of the UN Security Council within the international legal system? The second part of my question, and here I'm faced with a challenge <laughs> in that several parts of it have, have been answered already, so I'll do my best to, to reformulate it to some extent. Um, it relates to your intention to, to really develop a theory that applies to international law as a whole, uh, and perhaps I want to link it to your Proposition 5. So your Proposition 5 being that legal theory has imp important implications not only for law, but also the practice uh, of international law. Uh, and maybe I want to probe you a little bit further on the responses that you've already given uh, by sharing with us what could be the practical effect of your theory. Um, for instance, applying it to issues that you've mentioned before, you know, the, the increasing role of the individual and the human within the international legal system. It's kind of striking that your thesis still talks about state interstate uh, uh, disputes uh, in the first instance. Uh, and some of the issues that I've mentioned before, but I could add migration to the, to the list, for instance. Uh, but really, can you pick something that you think illustrates very well what could be the practical impact uh, of your findings. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, I, I'll deal with the, the negative methodology choices question first uh, before the practical effect one. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that the, the first point to be made here is that uh, the um, when I look at non-bilateral obligations, I'm predominantly focused on the structure of the obligation rather than the content. Um, so rather than the substantive, you know, the substantive content that is being um, required or obliged. Um, so in that respect, I um, I set out this this structural framework. So the you know bilateral obligations, bilateralizable obligations, and then the two different kinds of non-bilateral obligations. Um, and my, my sort of contention is that all obligations will fit somewhere within this framework. Uh, and I think, um, so when I use examples to, to show that, they are illustrative. So they are, they are more illustrative to explain the structural framework. Um, but I think that all of the, the obligations from all of the kind of areas of human rights law that, um, human rights law, climate law, um, would fit somewhere within that framework. Um, so that, yeah, I guess that is part of the answer that I think the, once the structural framework has been explained and illustrated, uh, my, my intention was that it would be self-explanatory how that would apply to different uh, kinds of obligations. And that kind of gets over the problem of having to look at every single obligation that, that promotes a common interest in international law. Um, um, I think also I, I 
part of what I try to highlight in the chapter on the kind of nature of obligations and the nature of interests, and specifically the part on environmental law, is that just because a rule protects uh, something like the environment that we gen generally consider to be one of these more like good or ethical parts of international law doesn't mean that it's a non-bilateral obligation. So there are obligations in international environmental law, like the, the um, obligations related to transboundary harm, for example, which uh, could, at least in some circumstances, be bilateral. They don't necessarily need to be non-bilateral. Um, um, I think, uh, in addition to that, my, my focus is very much on responsibility. So I think um, when we talk about sort of certain institutions like the, the UN Security Council, I think you mentioned, um, and other UN bodies, they are related per, in a per, peripheral per, oh, in a peripheral manner to the content of the thesis in that obviously the, the UN bodies are part of the structure that we have within international law that relates to the publicness of international law that I talk about in chapter uh, chapter five. But at the same time, they don't actually have a huge amount to do with responsibility per se. So I think the, you know, the, the development of these UN bodies, um, there is a limit to how much they can say about the nature of responsibility from a generalist perspective in international law. Uh, and then again, um, more generally on the question of why not focusing on um, some of these developments that are specifically in human rights law, uh, is that, as, as I said in relation to uh, Professor Zubri's question, uh, the, the aim is to have a general theory and yeah, while I don't necessarily want to delve into the question as to whether human rights law is a, is a kind of specialized regime and separate from international law, there are conclusions that you would draw from human rights law which wouldn't apply to the other aspects and so wouldn't be useful in developing a general theory. Um, and then the practical effect of my theory... Sorry, can I, can I just... Oh, sorry, yeah. um, could you explain to me what on your conception would be then the difference between your notion of responsibility and perhaps a broader notion of accountability? And is that a relevant question? It's a question that pops into my mind when you speak about the role of the UN Security Council. So, so I think for me, responsibility is quite specifically the legal consequences that arise as the... Um, as the con too many consequences. The legal consequences that arise um, following the breach by state responsibility is the, the legal consequences that arise following the breach by a state of an international legal obligation that is binding upon it. Accountability, I think, is much broader than that and uh, probably incorporates some non-legal aspects in relation to uh, ethics or morality or, or um, perhaps even political questions of justice and, and uh, yeah, is that okay? Um, the practical effect of the theory. Um, so I think, again, as I said before, the, the, the clearest practical effect can probably be seen in the, or the clearest way in which this theory can be operationalized in practice is seen in the, the chapter on international courts and tribunals and the ways in which the techniques that international courts and tribunals have to incorporate but to, to hear these kinds of cases and to incorporate broader interests in the actual proceedings. Um, so for example, the, um, I think, um, the use of Article 62 of the ICJ statute as a basis for um, third party intervention is an example of this. Um, so in that chapter, I apply the theory uh, and conclude that as a result, it should be possible for, or it is possible um, for states to intervene on the basis of, uh, of the breach of an obligation ergo omnis under Article 62. Um, but also in relation to the interpretation of um, certain aspects of the law of state responsibility. So one of the examples is um, the, uh, the effect of um, waiver and acquiescence by the injured state in the circumstance, like I gave the example of here, where you have a community interest obligation or an obligation ergo omnis that is violated, um, but then the state to, to whom the obligation was directly owed waives uh, its right to invoke responsibility. And how, uh, following the objective approach, the rights of other states would still stand um, because they are based objectively, the responsibility is not subjective as between the two states. So that's another uh, practical legal consequence of applying the theory to the law. If that answers your question. 
The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Selim. Dr. Selim is assistant professor in the Department of International and European Law at our university, and she is also the secretary to the Defense Committee. Dear candidate and dear Sally, if I may. So first of all, let me join also the others in congratulating you on this achievement. And for me personally, it's a real honor to be here and also a real pleasure to be here at your defense. And um, even though we have worked together for you know, several years and we've shared many lunches and coffees, I must admit that I only had a vague idea as to what your PhD research was on, uh, something uh, about state responsibility. So when I received your manuscript, I was firstly very happy, um, and especially when I saw your title, and I was convinced, oh, this thesis is definitely going to be about human rights law, <laughs> at least to a certain degree. Um, and of course, it is my own bias speaking as a human rights lawyer. Um, and then I read your thesis, and with a lot of pleasure, um, uh, it was very insightful, and I learned a lot, so it was very useful. But I must admit that I was a bit surprised about how few references there were to human rights law, as was already uh, also mentioned. So that is something that I would like to ask you uh, to reflect on a bit more. Um, how does an objective theory of state responsibility contribute to the promotion and protection of international human rights? And this kind of follows also from the previous question, and more specifically, um, this is something that I was wondering then is your analysis seems to be based on the premise that it is only or predominantly states that hold other states responsible. Um, but wouldn't such an objective theory, which is really based on non-compliance of a state with its international legal obligations, necessitate further examination into who could um, or should, I should say, be able to invoke state responsibility, so beyond just the state? And I do understand that in your thesis, you limit yourself to what, this, what the, lay, the, the law is. So um, and maybe I can push you a bit to reflect on where you think the law should go and what the next step then is. Uh, thank you very much for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, so two questions. How does the objective theory benefit the promotion and protection of human rights? And um, to reflect, well, three questions to reflect on where I think the law should go and also to think about the uh, the other ways, as opposed to state invocation, in which uh, state responsibility can be in invoked or uh, enforced, implemented. Um, so, firstly, in relation to how the objective theory benefits the promotion and protection of human rights, I think, uh, from a gen very general perspective, what the objective theory adds is. Um, is clarity and is more consistency within the area of, of state responsibility. Um, and within these kind of overarching questions that we don't seem to get, be able to get rid of as to um, the, the existence of injury and the necessity of injury and trying to interpret injury in different ways so as to fit it into the kinds of um, questions that come up uh, in relation to human rights. I think human rights, for the most part, is quite uh, involve quite clearly non-bilateral obligations. Um, so in the same ways in the example I talk about, uh, the obligation to protect internationally significant within significant biodiversity within your own borders, um, the obligation on states to protect uh, the rights of their own citizens or to um, ensure respect and fulfill the rights of their own citizens is uh, naturally a non-bilateral obligation. So all of, even though I don't use very many human rights examples, everything in the thesis will also apply to responsibility for, um, for those kinds of breaches. Um, the only exception to that, I think, is when you see human rights instruments that are breached by one state in relation to citizens of another state. So the Armenia case at the moment before the ICJ is applying the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I assume you would also kind of see that as a human rights instrument. Um, and um, the essential question is that Armenia is accusing Azerbaijan of violating the obligations in that convention in relation to Armenian people. So in that sense, that kind of example is a bit more like the old protection of nationals doctrine, and so it has a bit more of a bilateral element. At the same time, the, the convention is uh, built around this common interest. Um, so there you almost have a, a kind of overlap of those two things. Um, but generally speaking, human rights law, I think, is quite clearly non-bilateral obligations, and so everything would apply to human rights law. Um, what about others? 
actors holding states to account. So yeah, within human rights law in particular, we have structures where um, particular individual, particularly individual complaint mechanisms uh, is yeah, almost non-bilateralism. Um, uh, like the, the perfect example of a more non-bilateral uh, based system. And um, the reason I don't go into detail on that in my thesis is, as I said, it, it, it is in many ways particular to that area of law, so not uh, more generally, but it does, I think, uh, it is an example of international law developing in that direction towards more non-bilateral, uh, uh, an objective understanding of responsibility um, that doesn't require state invocation. Um, so I think the existence of those kinds of individual complaint mechanisms is also based on um, this objective conception of responsibility. Where I would like to see international law go, I think that is, um, that is a very big question. I would obviously like to see international law develop um, from a lawyer's perspective. I would like to see um, f further clarification and consistency within these uh, mechanisms and within these structures based on um, the kinds of conclusions that I come up with. From a personal perspective uh, or um, yeah, ethical perspective, I would like to see international law develop mechanisms that do um, work better for these kinds of non-bilateral obligations that further common interests. That said, I would also like to see in scholarship further uh, critical engagement with some of these ideas of common and community interests, because I think there has thus far, and I haven't contributed, so I'm also part of the problem, been relatively little critical engagement with the question of, you know, is it a, is this really a community interest or is this a club interest? Um, you know, when we look at custom and the, the state practice and opinion of European custom, we tend to look at a certain club of states. And I think the danger with concepts related to objective, uh, to non-bilateral responsibility is that we do the same with identifying community interest norms. So that is where I would like to see scholarship move. But yes. Now I am very happy to allow Professor Tsibiri to raise a second question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if we're gonna have the time, uh, Sarah, but there's something probably to, to think about. Um, you, you have referred to a lot of uh, the practice of international courts and tribunals and the international courts and tribunals are trying to remedy a little bit these problems with uh, not being able to address parties that are not, are not before the court through dicta, through recommendation type. And there, I think scholarship is a little bit divided on that in terms of whether they should be included or not and what is their role. Um, what would be your recommendation to the judges of the ICJ, ITLOS, and, and so on? Should they have more dicta to address these issues, also including uh, non-bilateral uh, non responsibility? Or should they stick with, uh, with what is basically the main case before them? Uh, ooh. <laughs> um, I mean, I think generally from a researcher's perspective, it's always interesting to get dicta because there's always something to say about it. Um, but I think, yeah, from, from um, I, I would prefer to see more elaborate reasoning on, uh, on why certain decisions are made and why certain kind of legal routes are taken within uh, cases. Um, I think sometimes there are cases where logical, jumps happen within the reasoning of the court that makes it unclear as to how exactly they conceive of these particular types of obligations or these particular types. Do you still like to finish uh, your reply? <laughs> <laughs> My sentence was going to finish these particular types of obligation or these particular types of responsibility. I think. Sarah Thin, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. I request that you and your company will await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare. Here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the skills lab where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their gym semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real-life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now we're at the Brightlands Camelot campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project. That includes planning, collecting data, analyzing and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get used to it quickly and having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while. <laughs> 
uns. Sarah Thin, did the Greek committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professors Wietmar and Van Heusten are authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University Custom. And I now invite your supervisors to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Sarah Finn, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, we now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dr. Thin, you started your doctoral research four years and four days ago. A month and four days ago, you already started your new job as an assistant professor in Nijmegen. The fact that you finished your PhD so punctually and have already secured an academic job in the meantime is no surprise to anyone who has worked with you in the past four years. Academically and intellectually, you were at such a high level already at the beginning of your PhD that writing a thesis often appeared to be only a matter of formality. Bernard van Housen and I, as your supervisors, quite early on realized that the standard piece of advice given to most PhDs, which is don't get involved in too many projects outside of your doctoral research, will actually not apply to you. It was simply impossible to hold you back. <laughs> and in your case, it would be wrong if it tried. I honestly cannot recall all the activities or events in which you were involved during your time at Maastricht and Hasselt. And each time Bernard and I saw you, we learned a, a, about another wonderful thing that you were doing either in academia and, or elsewhere. You were sometimes updating us on your various activities, from skateboarding to knitting, from bouldering to tailoring, from environmental and social activism to playing football, rugby, and ukulele. <laughs> and since you're inter alia a climber, it is only appropriate if I quote Sir Edmund Hillary. While on top of Everest, Sir Edmund said, I looked across the valley toward the great peak Makalu and mentally worked out a route about how it could be climbed. 
It showed me that even though I was standing on top of the world, it wasn't end of everything. I was still looking beyond to other interesting challenges. And this is very much how you seem to think too. When you are standing on the top, you're already thinking of a new challenge, and this is what you're probably doing right now. It sometimes indeed seemed as if you were simultaneously pursuing another scientific project in which you discovered how you stretch your day from 24 to at least 36 hours, and that this project also led to a PhD, perhaps one that's going to be defended this afternoon. <laughs> But on a more serious note, you actually will receive two PhD certificates. One you have already received from our university from Maastricht. The other one you will receive from Hasselt because you were a PhD candidate in the joint degree program between our institutions. And at this point, I would like to thank my co-supervisor, Bernard, who somewhere halfway into this project became the rector of Hasselt University. Despite his numerous responsibilities that came with the new position, he remained fully committed to this project and to making this cooperation between our institutions work. And I think we also proved the benefit of such um, cross-institutional um, and I indeed cross-border cooperations. But there are a few obstacles, of course. For example, you broke your arm skateboarding, but that didn't stop you. You found, you, find, you found a way to continue writing. And then we also had a pandemic with working from home in, in hard lockdowns and was sometimes very difficult to stay focused, but you somehow managed. And from those difficult moments, I still remember the powerful speech you delivered to the entire faculty over Zoom on the challenges we were facing and how to deal with them. I know that many of us, your colleagues, appreciated and still appreciate your words in that moment. You are very committed to the environmental causes, and it was no coincidence that your initial proposal was quite strongly grounded in, in environmental law. But then, as we say in research, the project had evolved. And some of the pressing environmental law issues could not be adequately explained without first tackling certain fundamental conceptual questions of law that are lurking in the background of the specific environmental problems. And this is how your thesis took a much more doctrinal approach than any one of us had initially envisaged. But we crossed this bridge together, you, Bernard, and I, unanimously, as we always were throughout the entire process. And in the end, your thesis was, well, quite black letter for someone who was running the Maastricht Study Group for Critical Approaches to International Law. <laughs> and this is perhaps how things should be. With this thesis, Sally, you demonstrated that you know how to assemble and construct legal arguments. You demonstrated that you understand the positive law and its shortcomings, what the law can and what the law cannot achieve, what societal problems the law can fix and where the law proves to be quite useless. And there is then time for extra legal argumentation. Now you have emerged as a scholar in your own right. Now you have a new academic home in Nijmegen, but I think that I speak on behalf of everyone with who you worked closely in Maastricht and Hasselt that you left a lasting impact at our institutions. And while we all regret that you've left, we are still fortunate that you will stay nearby so that we can continue to cooperate in other ways. And I will end with a thought of another climbing giant, my fellow Slovenian who said after returning from Everest in those old pre-commercialized days of pristine mountaineering, anyone looking for a goal will remain empty when the goal will be reached, but whoever finds a way 
will always carry the go inside. And now speaking on behalf of Bernard and I, we always had an impression that your PhD, that in your PhD, you were primarily looking um, for a way, that you were trying to find a way in the substantive argumentation and in the overall process. Your goal was never to only produce a thesis. So what you can celebrate today is more than the thesis itself. What you can celebrate is that you found your own way in scholarship. And this is why you are now not looking for a new beginning as an early career scholar. You defended your thesis today as an already established and respected authority in your field. Dr. Sarah Thin, congratulations on this achievement. Dear Dr. Thin, also on behalf of Maastricht University and its Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree that you just acquired. I always say it's the highest degree we have available at this university. Uh, sumos honores, as it says on the diploma that you uh, just uh, received. Um, and I, I, I very much would indeed like to endorse the words of uh, um, uh, one of your supervisors just spoken in the wonderful Audatio that indeed we have come to know you in our faculty uh, as a very special uh, and also important uh, uh, person, uh, as a highly talented and active member of our faculty community, with indeed many initiatives that you took, um, going sometimes far beyond the scope of your PhD. So we also hate to see you leave us um, here at Maastricht, as we can only congratulate Professor De Waale, whom we also very much welcome uh, here today to Maastricht University, Congratulate Professor De Waal uh, on the fact that he was able to, uh, uh, to attract you to the University of Nijmegen. Um, uh, it was also a special defense because of the fact that this has indeed been a joint degree project together with the University of, uh, 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 of Hasselt. Um, I am very happy that we have with us today not only the supervisor, Bernard van Heusten, but also the rector, Bernard van Heusten. Very much welcome also to our uh, university uh, uh, today. We very much value this cooperation uh, with the University um, of Hasselt. I also thank all committee members present here, um, and I congratulate the supervisors uh, also. But most of all, I congratulate Dr. Finn, um, and her family and friends uh, present here in this aula or watching this ceremony uh, online. Um, I still have one practical remark to make, which is that I um, may invite the audience present here in the aula uh, for the reception on behalf of uh, our young uh, doctor. Um, the, the, uh, I would like to ask you to uh, uh, give uh, a, a first priority to the uh, young doctor and her paranyms and the committee when going to uh, the reception that is going to take place in the rafter right here in this, uh, in this building. You are already allowed to also go there. We will still stay behind a bit somewhere halfway because we are going to take the traditional photo with the young doctor. Uh, on the stairs uh, here in the hall of our beautiful university building. And with that, I close this academic ceremony.